let's talk about Diamond Comic Distributors. Diamond is one of those places that has a long and sometimes tenuous history with the comic book industry. And it all starts with one man. It starts with Steve Jeppy. Jeppy's is a true rags to riches tale. By following his lifelong passion for comics, he went from postal carrier to tycoon comic distributor virtually overnight. Welcome back, readers. My name is Christian, and this is Comic Central. You know, with more than 2,000 comic book stores in the United States, all of them receive hundreds, if not thousands, of comic books each month that they then have to sell to readers like me and you. They come from a place called Diamond Comics Distributors. And really, all you have to do is order your order three months in advance, pay $425, have a business license with a brick-and-mortar store or an online presence with an online store that has a shopping cart that allows you to take credit cards. See how easy that was? In 1974, United States Postal Service driver Steve Jeppe opens a comic book store after seeing the earning potential that comic books have. He had delivered comics to comic book stores, so why not start his own? He starts Jeppe's Comic World in a basement in Baltimore, Maryland. And that basement was underneath a TV repair shop. In 1982, Steve incorporates Diamond Comics Distributors for the very first time, taking over distribution of two major distributors on the East Coast, New Media Distribution and Urjax Enterprises. And he takes over control of their Boston and Tampa Bay distribution centers. This one move cements him as the largest distributor in the East, and all he does is start out with 17 customers and one warehouse. But he wasn't done. The 80s were good to Steve. He actually sets his sights over to the West Coast, purchasing Bud Plant Distribution in 1988, making Diamond officially a national brand. Now, the 90s are really where Diamond cements themselves as the dominant force in comic book distribution. In 1990, they take over a couple of companies named Destiny Distribu Distributors and Second Genesis, two Oregon distributors that up until a few years ago had gotten all of their comics from a little place down south called Bud Plant. And they'd been in the game since the 70s and 80s, so they, it's not their first rodeo, but they just were taken over by the bigger fish in the smaller pond. Speaking of ponds, in 91 to 93, Diamond actually crosses the pond and goes to the United Kingdom and purchases two of their biggest distributors, Pacific and Titan Distributors. This immediately makes them the largest distributor of comics in the United Kingdom. In 1996, though, Diamond absorbs their biggest competitor at the time, Capital City Distribution. This is after Capital lost a distribution of Marvel Comics and they were edged out of the market after Diamond signs exclusive deals with DC Comics, Image Comics, and Dark Horse Comics. But the last gem in, I guess you could call it Diamond's infinity gauntlet of comic book distribution, was Marvel. In 1994, Marvel had purchased a competitor of Diamond's called Heroes World and attempted to do their own in-house distribution. They were successful for a few years, but after three years in 1997, even Marvel had to fold. And then even Marvel had to start signing with Diamond to get their comics distributed. Now, I know what you're thinking. Christian, isn't what Diamond's doing considered a monopoly? And, and you'd think so. I think so. And in 1997, so did the U.S. Department of Justice. They started investigating Diamond, signing the possibility of a monopoly. It took them three years of investigation to conclude that while Diamond wait for it, essentially owned comic book distribution, they couldn't be considered a monopoly because they didn't own all of book distribution and all of periodical distribution. But there's a precedence for monopolies in comic books, and it starts 30 years earlier with a guy named Phil Suling, the father of the direct market model that comic books uses today. Phil sold the idea of direct to consumer marketing to both Marvel and DC in the early 1970s, and he started Seagate Distribution. So what he did is he set up 17 sub-distributors that sold comics directly to stores, and his rules, very much like George Washington's run of president, sets many of the precedents that we in the comic book industry still use today. The chief among them, and probably the most irritating, is you can't return comic books. Yeah, you, did you know that? 
you can't return comic books. In 1978, though, Urjax Enterprises levied a lawsuit claiming that Suling had a monopoly, and they won, which results in Phil having to break up Seagate into 17 small distributors, only for all 17 of them, including Urjax, to be absorbed by Diamond. So what does monopoly mean for the comic book industry? Well, it means a couple of different things. First, and foremost is that Diamond can control whether your comic book gets sold in comic shops. Diamond employs things like minimum sales requirements, requiring a smaller creator to hit a certain number a month before they'll be able to be distributed by Diamond. That's $2,500. Now, if a comic book on average is $3 a pop, it takes 2,100 comics consistently to be distributed by Diamond. And that makes it difficult for small creators to be seen by larger audiences, even in the time of the internet. Secondly, if they don't like your book, they can get you canceled, man. Take Miracle Man number nine, for instance. It depicts a very graphic birth, and it angers a lot of people. One of those people being Steve Jeppe himself, who then went on to disparage the comic book and almost got it canceled. Now, Miracle Man has its own issues that we'll get into later on in a different video, but what it led to was stricter guidelines and codes by Marvel and DC for what comic books could and could not depict when it came to violence and it came to things that had a lot of blood. Probably my most infuriating thing is if your books get damaged, they don't have to pay you back. They don't have to replace your stuff if it gets damaged, and that sucks. The last thing that a monopoly does is not challenge the industry in any way whatsoever. It doesn't have to improve because there's only one person who does the thing. No competition means no innovation, and no innovation leads to complacency. I keep throwing out all of these things about Diamond, but at the same time, the publishers are at fault as well. I'm gonna be honest with you whenever I say this, and I think it's fairly controversial, but I think it's time that publishers find other outlets for distributing their comic books. Take DC, for example. In March 2020, during the global pandemic, they made a decision to move away from a sole distributor model to a multi-distributor model, ending their exclusive uh, deal with Diamond, and they had had that for almost 30 years. And that one move by DC removed 30% of the comic book market share from Diamond Comics in a single swoop. DC is not perfect. With this market share moved, they've had to go to several smaller regional distributors, and there's some difficulty in that model. DC now uses things like Lunar Distribution, Penguin Random House, and smaller collectibles retailers to distribute all of their stuff, their comic books, their trade paperbacks, their toys, and their collectibles to those over 2,000 comic book stores each week. And the growing pains are real, but so is the potential for the shakeup of the industry, and it could inspire other publishers to enact or explore similar models. Is it perfect? No. Will it last? Uh, only time will tell. I want to thank you for coming back and seeing the second video in this series on Comic Central. As always, like the video if you liked it. You know, subscribe if you loved it. If you have any feedback, put it in the comments down below. I'm always going to be reading, which is probably not good for my mental health, but it's going to be very exciting to see your opinions. Um, for Comic Central, as always, my name is Christian. You are who you are. I am who I am. Read on, readers, and we'll see you next time.